Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, really thrilled to tell you a bit more about uh, our perspective on the future of healthcare and pharma in uh, particular. Um, well, as mentioned, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Visium, where we help solving uh, pharma's most pressing needs with the use of AI. And today I wanted to uh, take a bit uh, more of a future-looking perspective on the question. So um, it starts from, from this quote, which I've always found pretty uh, compelling. Uh, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And with this idea in mind, I'd like um, to uh, do a, a mental exercise together and try to visualize, picture uh, the pharma landscape in 2032. Top pharma players then will uh, certainly have access to a wealth of tools that we're currently building and that um, we're currently hoping uh, to yield fruits. Uh, they will, for instance, be able to generate uh, and develop new drugs with fully AI-powered uh, processes, well, with uh, target identification done in a matter of minutes, or graph generative uh, models being able to spin out uh, small molecules for treating specific uh, diseases. The descendant of uh, alpha folds uh, will be able to design proteins with very specific and targeted properties to uh, target um, well, the, 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 the disease of interest. And all of this will be done in a highly automated uh, lab environment with automated sets of experiments and validation uh, that will be um, able to, to speed up the, the process altogether. On the entire other side of the spectrum, we'll have a widespread adoption of precision medicine with healthcare professionals and patients uh, daily, relying daily on these tools and, and services, and um, well, pharma companies leveraging this to fuel their uh, large scene uh, and cell and gene uh, therapy portfolios. The idea there will, of course, be to um, better identify the, the target uh, um, uh, populations and serve them in the most efficient way possible. Now, you may ask, with, with this brave new world in mind, where uh, will pharma companies actually compete and how will they be able to beat um, the competition? Well, uh, we can look at this in two ways. On the one hand, they will be able to further improve their core competencies by, for example, identifying new target areas more efficiently or bringing treatments to patients faster by speeding up the clinical development uh, processes but they will also need to go beyond their traditional business model and look at uh, improving outcomes of patients in the clinic by, for instance, optimizing their patient journeys or complementing existing treatments with alternatives. Uh, another example would be to serve healthcare professionals with digital tools to better treat patients. And these uh, two examples, of course, these two directions uh, are particularly key, especially the second one, because new players will come outside players, uh, tech native companies will come and start eating up market bits, um, um, bits by bits. So what will pharma uh, companies leverage to actually play on these two fields? Well, you guessed it, that's the title of uh, the talk as well. Real world data will um, fuel all of these um, innovations and, and this uh, competitive landscape. It will be used in um, AI insights generators to generate real-world evidence through several um, uh, pipelines of data engineering, advanced AI and machine learning models, and ML operationalization techniques. Uh, now, with this in mind, um, well, you, you might tell me, well, real-world evidence has been around for a while already. Why, why should it be that different now? Well, it's been around, but there is a technological gap that is leading to a knowledge gap uh, that is increasing over time. First of all, when we talk about real-world evidence now, we oftentimes think about the conventional RWE, which relies on standard statistics and descriptive analysis, tap on relatively limited number of data sources, and has difficulty to generalize to, due to the limited view on the variable considered. Uh, these techniques are useful, uh, but limited, and they can only answer simple questions, such as what kind of patients is using therapy X, or what is the adherence to therapy Y? On the other side of spectrum, we have advanced real-world evidence, leveraging advanced data science approaches, such as predictive models, unsupervised machine learning, probabilistic causal models, 
And these will um, grow in the future, especially uh, because they consider many interconnected data sources, electronic health records, claims data from insurers, sensors and wearables, social media, patient survey, patient reported outcomes, omics data, et cetera, et cetera. All this wealth of data um, can be explored using um, advanced models, and this will only accelerate in the years to come. So these, um, um, these uh, solutions will be able to answer more complex questions, such as which patients uh, subsegments respond best to therapy X, um, and what are patient characteristics that predict uh, switch from drug X to drug Y. Uh, these are just initial examples. Of course, we'll, uh, we'll get to more uh, futuristic uh, use cases in a second. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because this advanced real-world evidence is already bringing a lot of value um, today and in, in, in the near future. It was estimated in a recent study uh, that uh, more than 300 million uh, could be generated by large pharma players over the next two to five years by leveraging advanced uh, real-world evidence. Uh, this can be done on the one hand by optimizing bottom line, so reducing costs uh, on, on, on clinical trials. Um, for instance, uh, there have been a few successful uh, launches using synthetic uh, control arms, uh, but also increasing top line by speeding up the development um, of uh, the drugs altogether and accelerating uh, time to market. Let me perhaps spend a few minutes on talking you through some of the uh, existing successes in, in real-world evidence and how these affect the full value chain uh, of pharma and not only market access as it's sometimes believed. Well, let's start from early research and development. Uh, real-world evidence can be used to identify and quantify unmet needs to inform research decisions and also uh, define optimal dosing based on um, uh, uh, formularies to improve outcomes. In clinical development, innovative trial design, uh, such as the ones just mentioned, using synthetic control arms can uh, reduce significantly the costs of uh, the operations, and improved trial design can um, be leveraged, uh, can leverage real-world evidence, uh, for instance, to better determine the inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, the definition of uh, the sample sizes required for certain studies, uh, accelerate recruitment, select sites, um, and um, overall accelerate time to market. If we look at market access, this is the um, uh, prime example um, and where it all started from in a certain sense. The value that uh, real-world evidence bring is uh, the, 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 uh, the advantages of a given product compared to existing solutions. So showing the economic value, comparing trial data with real-world data to make sure uh, that the submission is strong and um, enabling outcome-based processing as well. Um, all in all, uh, it also uh, enable uh, label expansions. We've seen two recent examples um, in, uh, in, in this case where label expansion were granted based uh, almost solely on um, real-world data observational studies. And uh, lastly, um, the positioning of the drug can be strengthened by conducting head-to-head -head in silico trials to show efficacy and safety. In uh, sales and marketing, um, real-world evidence can be used to improve targeting, to identify super responders, or to identify populations that are at risk of uh, discontinuation or switch. It can be used to inform design of patients' uh, services and solutions, to refine the commercial strategies, and to build clinical decision support systems for the point of care. And lastly, uh, well, the uh, medical uh, the field can also benefit from real-world evidence in pharma companies by improving the pharmacovigilance activities, providing uh, real-world uh, monitoring of, of what's happening with products out there, strengthen the evidence for differentiation even further, and improve the effectiveness of medical affairs altogether. So you've seen across these examples that there has already been some movements from um, regulatory bodies in this direction. And um, indeed, the FDA has launched last December a new set of guidelines for real-world evidence and, and uh, real-world data-based studies. And they uh, actually claim that it's going to play an increasing role in healthcare decisions. So this trend, this regulatory trend, combined with other trends, uh, will indeed bring us to uh, something pretty exciting in 10 years from now. Um, so the regulatory support is one of these elements, and we have two other technical elements that will 
develop into uh, something pretty key in the years to come. First of all, data-centric artificial intelligence, which uh, involves curating data sets in the most ideal way to optimize model performances, will enable uh, certain predictive uh, performance that were previously unseen. And on the other hand, foundation models, which are general purpose, super powerful uh, models that can be used for a variety of use cases, will grow in importance in the years to come, especially in the field of natural language processing. You might have seen some of these foundation models without knowing uh, them yet, but for instance, if you saw images of stable diffusion or DALI in the last few weeks, well, this is the class of models that we consider as foundation models. Together, these trends will um, enable some um, use cases in 10 years from now across uh, the, 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 the space. Um, for instance, we'll be able to interrogate healthcare patients, uh, healthcare uh, professionals and patients as if they were in the room using these super advanced natural language uh, foundation models will leave no clinical notes unturned. Uh, we can uh, um, easily ask questions such as what bothers ALS patients the most and get thousands if not millions of answers from um, uh, primary care contact um, doctors to physicians and analyze this at scale. Secondly, data-centric AI will um, be paramount to efficiently fuse data sources, uh, combine, for instance, omics profiles and outcome data to guide cell and gene therapy in covering all patients with precision medicine and not focusing only on the, on the main population. So really serving the underserved populations too. Third, um, if we combine real-time, uh, real-world data with real-time, we get real-time, real-world evidence uh, for supply chain optimization and feeling the pulse of the global healthcare system to avoid shortages will uh, make it um, uh, very, uh, very feasible to, uh, not avoid, uh, to not have these, uh, these issues in the future. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, combination of digital and physical therapeutics will drive outcome-based medicine and serving digital therapeutics will be paramount to pharma players as well especially for the risks mentioned in the introduction around the uh, entry players. And, and, and it's no surprise that Google and Amazon are also entering the healthcare space. So uh, real world data will be the fuel to this uh, trans transformation as well. So you, you might wonder, now, now this is very nice, it's uh, 10 years ahead, but where do we start? So if we look back at the very uh, initial uh, view on uh, having this insights generator that takes real-world data and outputs uh, insights, uh, we can build this uh, based, well, on the one hand, on data engineering to combine the multiple data sources that are electronic health records, uh, internal uh, data run, randomized control trials, um, and, and omics data, for instance, together with the analytical models that enable uh, the insights generation. And um, if we then provide the good input to ask the right questions in um, the insight generation uh, process through a solid uh, foundational strategy, we can then obtain the insights and distribute them both internally and externally to, for instance, patient, regulators, or hearing uh, healthcare professionals in the future. Um, insights such as individualized treatment protocols are regrouped in this, in this family, um, data-driven understanding of disease mechanism, real-world outcome, and head-to-head -head comparison of effectiveness. Uh, just so, a few examples in this direction. This might sound a bit complex, so um, you, you might wonder, well, great, but where should I really start from now? And uh, everything needs to be aligned with the general strategy of uh, the, the company itself. What is the precision medicine strategy that the company is, is trying to achieve? What is its competitive strategy? And with this, um, will inform then the decision on which data sets to acquire in order to answer these, uh, these critical questions and where to go next. So happy to uh, take any questions now. Thank you very much for your attention and um, hope to speak to you at our booth as well. Thank you.